why it is important to understand key concepts of history. Often history is taught in such a way that students immediately study events and dates that characterize a particular period. However, the broader context that characterizes all of modern times is missed, so the underlying causes of events and the coherence slip away. This deprives the historical periods of connection and results in the student trying to memorize dates and events in isolation, make it much more difficult. This is why we present for you the key concepts, the structural elements of modern history. It does not matter what period you study, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century or the contemporary history. These concepts play a huge role during all the modern history. Let's begin. The first thing to look at are the great powers. The great powers determine the course of history in many ways. Major events will be connected in one way or another to the activities and relationships of a small number of countries. In the course of history, the number of great powers has constantly changed, with each period characterized by its own set of great powers. For example, in the early 19th century it was Britain, France, Austria, Prussia and Russia. And in the second half of the 20th century there were two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. The next thing you gotta keep in mind is sovereignty, the supreme authority, the right to rule. The emergence of this concept is closely associated with the Westphalian peace after the Thirty Years' War. You see, before that, a king was not a sovereign because his rule was influenced by the involvement of the church. But after that treaty all the kings in Europe became sovereign. This subsequently led to the emergence of absolute monarchies. But the French Revolution and the revolutions of 1948 as well as many other events after that challenged this notion of sovereignty. The idea would be to extend the concept of sovereignty to all citizens of the state. And that's how it works today. The need for enlightenment was dictated, again, by the decline in influence of the church and the need to develop new social norms. The key principles would be individual liberty, religious tolerance, opposition to absolute monarchy and the fixed dogmas of the church. The Age of Enlightenment is associated mainly with the 17th and 18th centuries, and authors such as Voltaire, Rousseau, Immanuel Kant, David Hume, and so on. However, it is important to understand the long-lasting effects of the Enlightenment and its failures, which, as Peter Sloterdijk notes, has led to a spread of cynicism and ideologies in the 19th and 20th centuries. Well, you see, I think everything's terrible anyhow. Really? Yes. I've been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. I've had a very bad time, Nikki. I'm pretty cynical about everything. Ever since Christopher Columbus set out on his famous voyage in 1492, which resulted in Europeans discovering America, Colonialism has been an integral part of human history. The development of shipbuilding and other technology greatly increased the presence of Europeans in every corner of the world. The great powers would wage many colonial wars, both with native populations and against each other, for the right to influence. On this map you can see the metropolises and the colonies by the end of 19th century. With the small exception of the grey zones, most of which, by this time, have gained the independence, the rest of the world is in colonial dependence. Colonialism would affect the destinies of many individuals, ethnic groups and nations. The opposite process would be decolonization the desire of colonized territories for independence, which would lead to the emergence of many new states, especially after World War I and World War II. And there is no doubt that after the war, independence will come. This brings us to the subject of nationalism. You see, the nation states that are so commonplace now are a relatively new phenomenon that has been around for about 200 years. 
Until the late 18th century, people had no concept of a nation and often self-identified with their place of origin and residence, village, city, local region and so on. However, in the late 18th and especially in the 19th century, the idea that a nation should have sovereignty and live in its own state became popular. Here we come back to the notion of sovereignty. In addition to the events already mentioned in that section, it is necessary to note the independence of USA and the republics of Spanish America, then followed by unification of Italy and Germany in the mid-19th century, and of course the aftermath of the World War I when many new European nations emerged and the aftermath of World War II when many nations emerged all over the world. Many scholars have noted a certain speculativeness in the idea of nations and view them as socially constructed and historically contingent, as for example it was described by Benedict Anderson in his famous book Imagine Communities. Nationalism and its extreme forms have led humanity to the greatest conflicts in its history. Capitalism plays a major role in modern history. Imagine a city from the 15th, 16th centuries like Florence or Venice. This is where goods from all over the world are concentrated. Trading is done by merchants, a group that is unlike to any other at this time. The intensification of trade and the penetration of Europeans into the new world leads to the formation of a new class, the bourgeoisie. The rise of this class led to significant changes as it would demand political rights. It is important to remember that capitalism evolved significantly from the agrarian stage to industrial capitalism in the 18th and 19th centuries. If capitalism before then was, as Adam Smith described it, a relationship between small producers, the butcher, the brewer or the baker, with the development of railroads, ships that can carry great loads, the telegraph, the telephone and so on, capital begins to enlarge. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. The scale of production becomes quite different, many factories and plants emerge. All this changes the life of mankind considerably. People move into cities in large numbers and the working class grows. Capitalism, despite its positive aspects, has its antagonisms. This phenomenon is brilliantly portrayed in Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. We see a man who is only a small part of a great machine. He works under harsh conditions, at the limit of human ability. And, as a result, he goes mad. Much related to the development of capitalism will be the theme of science and technologies. Mankind made a tremendous leap in this area in the 19th and 20th centuries. On this slide you can see the main technological innovations that have appeared in the modern era. The development of science and technology on the one hand pushed capitalism forward. On the other hand, capitalism itself demanded more and more technological advantages. Another significant driver of science and technology was the military industry, especially during World War I and World War II. Another phenomenon related to the previous two themes is urbanization. As you can see, at the beginning of the 19th century begins the growth of the urban population in the United States. The graph does not include Europe, but the situation is the same there. This is dictated by the development of industrial capitalism, which requires a concentration of labor. Urbanization significantly changes people's lives on many levels. If before people lived primarily in the countryside, always outdoors, farming and herding, now they live in dense build-up areas, constantly interacting with various machines and mechanisms. Work and leisure activities change substantially. The concentration of many people in one place changes political life since it is now much easier to get information to the masses and mobilize them. 
This leads us to the topic of workers and their rights. In the 19th century, the working class becomes a significant political entity that demands political rights. The first occupational injury and retirement pensions did not appear until the late 19th century, as it was at first introduced in Germany. Failure or unwillingness to deal with the problems of the working class will lead to many strikes and revolutions. It would probably take an entire academic course to fully cover ideologies. The flowering and proliferation of ideologies is certainly one of the hallmarks of modern times. Ideologies were the answer, something that filled the vacuum in the mass consciousness that religion and enlightenment could not fill. Ideologies were on the one hand a driving force and on the other a product of the political movements that developed explosively in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. In the 20th century ideological confrontation reached its peak when the whole world was divided into two ideological camps. International organizations are also another product of modern times. Before that time, the international dimension did not exist, as each macro-region was essentially a separate world. But with the European penetration into other parts of the world, the world became more and more global. For a long time, warriors, thinkers and philosophers have spoken and written about the need for an international institution for dialogue. But the first and rather weak attempts were made only in the 19th century, for example the Holy Alliance, which, however, did not last long at all. It was only towards the end of World War I that a general understanding of the need for an international institution emerged. The League of Nations was created to prevent further conflict on this scale, but the League of Nations had many weaknesses and could not fulfill its main task. Japan's forceful infiltration into Jahal, coming so soon after her Manchurian annexation. After the World War II, the United Nations was established as the main, but not the only, international institution. In the second half of the 20th century, the number and importance of international institutions grew considerably. And these are the key themes that we advise you to pay attention to as you study or revisit history of modern era. What would you add to this list? Write it in the comments. And to add a good history book to your reading list, watch this video.